Have you ever thought just how boring or ridiculous news commentary is today? Welcome to The Real Jacks Podcast with Jim and Larry. The Real Jacks Podcast. From crime and politics to entertainment, you can expect something different. Now, let's get real, Jacks. Hey, welcome back to Real Jacks with Jim, Larry, and Crawfish. Today's special guest is former police officer Pete Solis. We've got former police officer Dave Clark hiding over here in the shadows out of the camera. Mm-hmm. And we can't get him in front of the camera, so that's not even going to happen. We get him a chair in the back. We, we, we're going to try. We'll yeah. try. Uh, before we get into what Pete's been doing lately and tell us about that and some of his career, Larry's going to talk about our sponsors. Yeah, we'll get through that pretty quick. Um, first ad is Extreme Wings, obviously my new employer for convenient locations, family sports restaurant grill, more than just wings. A tremendous barbecue open since 2007, 8927 Herlong Road. Open 11 to 8, Tuesday through Saturday and Sunday, 11 to 3. Full barbecue menu, everything homemade. They'll cater anything, and they love first responders. Vance Window Tent, 5024 Sunbeam Road. My buddy Ricky Tillman's place. Over 26 years' experience here. It's a 3M Platinum dealer, highest level of 3M dealer. They tent vehicles, homes, and businesses. we got Secure One Protection Services, Jim's company. Secure One, your number one choice for protection since 1986. 356-1111. Excellent. Uh, Dibble Roofing, that's Norm Brewers. Uh, He works for them. He's been open since 1949. You call Norm at 904-910-5728 or email him at norm.dibbleroofing at gmail.com. D-Way Towing, obviously our our standard uh, monthly show with Doug Dixon, 100 South Jackson Avenue. (laughs) Phone number is 904-356-3929. They'll take care of all your towing needs. Shannon Judge, Legends of Real Estate. You can email her at shannonjudgerealestate at gmail.com or call her at 200-8158. Lastly, we got Mounts of Roof Fund. Mike Kellum, former JSO and his friend of mine, uh, served North Florida for 15 years, over 10,000 parties. Mounts of Roof offers a large selection of inflatable hoppers, water slides, interactive games, concessions, and frozen drinks. Offers large event tents, tables, and chairs. Always discounts to first responders. If you rent on the weekend, you keep the the equipment on the whole weekend. So. Cool. We really appreciate our sponsors too. Absolutely. So today's show is uh, going to be kind of a two-parter. So you want to stick around and make sure you get through the first part so you can hear the second part. Pete, it's good to see you, brother. Oh, it's good to Excellent. be here, guys. Thanks yeah. for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yes, Honored. Absolutely. What are you doing these days? Uh, presently, um, I'm working with the uh, FDLE as an inspector and um, traveling around the state, some out-of-state work, but... Um, Predominantly, all I'm doing is training young police officers in active shooter response and a counter ambush, two things I'm pretty familiar with. Tell, you were telling me about that yeah. before we got on the air. Go into detail because that that's, that's awesome. That needs to be part of any uh, training program, any police training program. Yeah, absolutely. At least in Florida. At, yeah, least, at least starting here in Jacksonville, yeah. for starters. Absolutely. Let me, let me back up just a step. The reason I initially got involved with FDLE is because I heard – um, that they were going to stand up a counterterrorism unit for the state. And uh, that's, that's my lane. So um, that's initially how I got involved with them. That didn't pan out for me, which is, ended up being a blessing because it, it led me to the inspector position. And that in turn uh, led me to meet a gentleman by the name of Tim Stanley down in Orlando. Tim was one of the SWAT officers that uh, initially responded to the Pulse incident and was heavily involved in that. And uh, he knew that Law enforcement initially didn't react the way we wanted them to react uh, on that shooting situation, so he created his own training for that, and I was introduced to it, and I asked him if he'd allow me to run do the gun work side of it because of my time after JSO and with JSO, my overseas um, experiences. He let me do that, and we have tweaked it to the point where we've taken it pretty much all over the country. We had Texas Rangers down here about six months ago in Orlando and put all of them through it. And uh, so we have, we've had a lot of success with it. But basically what it does, it trains that individual officer that is by he or she by themselves. To no backup. No, no backup, backup on site. No, right. no, you're it. Right. And we teach them um, how to work as safely as they can be to get, in that, get inside that particular uh, situation and end it. So stuff that happened real quick before your 35 gets there. You know who could probably really benefit from this mm-hmm. is um, county deputies. Oh, absolutely. They're always out in the middle of nowhere waiting yeah. on a 35. 
because they're yeah. they're spread. Stop, stop the dying. They're oh, spread. absolutely. Yeah. Stop it right now. Go so, ahead. And go ahead. it's not you know we tell them it's the you know I have blood in the game now. I've got a yeah. young man that's uh, with JSO. So if he had to respond, this is exactly what I would want him to do. Um, and we do we do cater to the smaller agencies all over the state to make sure they're taken care of. But uh, this thing is evidence based at this point. Um, it's Scambia County. About a year ago, we were up there, put them through this program. They, in turn, put all their officers through it, all their school resource officers through it. It wasn't a couple months later. We have an active shooter terrorist situation at NAS Pensacola, where my son-in-law was prior to this. And they went in and stopped it. And they, they ended it. And they ended it textbook fashion. And we got it all on film. So it works. Awesome. And it's, oh, it's, let me tell you something. It's about putting you, turning your hat around backwards and, uh, and getting it. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So, yeah, we don't hold back. We give these young officers absolute truth. We tell them what it's like from in my experiences to take impacts, what it's like to put rounds on a body, why you want to close. Take a the, punch and keep keep, yeah. keep, keep, yeah. keep staying in the game. Well, exactly. Take, take hits. Yeah. Take hits, not just punches. Take yeah, hits take and, hits and keep running. And yeah. what's that What's that experience all about yeah. and why that happens to you? Yeah. And then. Uh, well, a lot of people, they get psyched out. They get a. Yeah. Well, it wound or a punch and they're immediately like they're psyched out of the game we're like, oh my god yeah. i'm hurt i'm on the ground i'm i'm i'm, yeah. I'm out their mind's not gonna, psychological yeah their mind's not going to go where their body hadn't been already so we try to inoculate them to that you know we take them into that environment live fire everything uh they're moving out of the holster everything that you would not do on a static range we do and uh, we also teach them to move from doorways entry points all the way to contact and why they want to do that so you're um, giving them the experience without having the real experience oh yeah so they're 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 learning it knowing what it's like it's like getting punched in the face you ever been punched in the face right. you probably need to get punched in the face yeah at least once in your life so you know yeah. what it's like and you go all right i'm not done I'm, i can stay in yeah and we demo everything we walk in and say hey this is not beyond your reach and this is not high speed this is what you should have been doing right off the get-go and yeah it opens their eyes to what they really need to be able to do in a combat situation um, because this is still a contact sport regardless of what society tells you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you still got to be able to take care of yourself, yeah. period. Full contact sport, that's for sure. Yeah. So you, you talk about the entry points to uh, till they make contact. Explain why that's important to them, especially these young officers out there. that, that Well, because of commitment. <laughs> commitment. And it's highly overrated taking a hit. So for me, example, and I've seen commitment like – overseas a lot and if you don't put these people down decisively what happens is they engage somebody from the door but they don't eliminate the threat he or she doesn't have any collateral damage responsibilities they're going to roll over and kill everything in the room mm -hmm. they're going to do as much damage as they can do because they're committed to the act that they're doing mm -hmm. and uh, god forbid i just left the south the south border two months ago and the stuff that i saw coming across that border we need to all be prepared well, you got you got to have the same mindset they've got, and their mindset is I ain't holding back. I'm I'm out. Oh yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. to kill this guy. And numbers doesn't you, you intimidate them. That mindset. Yeah, the more the better. You know, one will take on twenty, and I, I saw that firsthand overseas. But, um, yeah, I mean it's it's a wake up call to all of them. For example, um, we trained a bunch of a bunch of law enforcement from South Carolina, and their protocol when they hit the business or school or wherever the active shooter was, was to announce loudly to try to get the perpetrators um, to address them and not the civilians uh, in the in the environment, you know, to turn all his attention on them. And we told them, and you know, we didn't feel that way because, number one, he has no collateral duty responsibility. If you create a disturbance, it's, you know, down that hallway or if he hears you calling, He's going to be the only one that hears you, by the way, because of stress. He's just going to turn around and kill everything in the hallway to get to you. So we told him it was probably to their best interest to keep your mouth shut, be quiet, turn your head around backwards, find a lane, don't di create disruption. You don't have time to stop for bleeds. Uh, and the way you're positioned, by the way. Oh, no, yeah. You, you have to have blinder. If it doesn't have a gun in its hand, you're not concerned with it. You need to go to point A to point B as quick as possible and end it, period. Terminate. Terminate it, period. And uh, and everybody behind you will take care of everything else that needs to be addressed, you know, injured, et cetera. But you need to end the shooting, period. So uh, that's – we've been endorsed by FDLE, and it's been an outstanding program. It's already proven 
and we've taken it all over the state. How long How long does a course, a typical course, last? Like you said, the Texas Rangers came in. Is that like a weekend thing or a week-long thing? Or uh, You know what? It's a, We can do it two, one or two ways. If we do it um, to standard, it's a two-day course. First day is all live fire. Mm-hmm. Second day is all role play with mm-hmm. sims or, um, you know. Yeah. And then, but if we, if they, if for the agency doesn't have time to get that many officers off the street for two days, we'll come in and do a live fire event for the whole eight hour day, and they get a very good picture of, of what to expect. Sounds like a, a perfect in service training program. It's an outstanding to, to well, add, add to the in service yeah. training. Well, a lot of agencies now, smaller agencies, are using it for their in service. You know, they're booking us out five or six, seven months, and uh, we roll in and do that for all their in service people. If it's a smaller agency, we can generally do uh, 40 students in two days, you know. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Can can, uh, can non or not current or former LE do the program? Um, as of right now, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I'd have to ask my supervision uh, with FDLE. But, you know, right now we've, uh, we're have we pushing it toward the recruit base where we can really have an impact um, because, you know, the, once you understand the dynamics of a firefight, it doesn't matter what situation you're in, the response is relatively the same. You need to be able to fight with both hands. You need to be able to move 360. Mm-hmm. And um, and when that when that is open to the student, when they realize they can do that and they can do that very safely, then we told we teach them how to fight out of crowds, how to protect that weapon system, pull it in tight, and let what's really going to protect them their vision. So they capture the entire room or the entire scene, um, and then we start really making headway with them at that point. The kind of light bulb goes off. They realize that they don't have to come out of the holster half the time, and when they do it, they mean business with it. Well, they, they train, they re- remove some of that auditory exclusion. When you know they, they learn under stress and that dynamic training like that, they, they to an extent, see, yeah, you're absolutely see little, correct. See things yeah. from a little wider perspective yeah. as opposed to just you know having blinders. Yeah. On. So you're using more of your senses. Yeah, we go deep in the weeds, by the way, on that, too, during the whole course. We talk about uh, combat stress and when the cocktail's released into the system and, you know, what's going to be there. Gross motor's going to be there. Your vision generally is going to be there, but it, you're, you're going to lose your peripheral. Or if you get in a light, you know, a dark environment, your, your ears are cut on, you know, auditory cuts on at that point. And then why we as humans are designed to take impacts to the perimeter, the arms, the legs, and, and, and keep fighting. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we're... We're designed to be predator-based, not prey, and uh, so we're really threat-focused, and that's a whole other program, but, you know, we address that as well about seeing impacts on target, looking right through your hands, and this is how we move, and um, we take what they're going to do naturally under stress, and we tweak it and make them exceptionally proficient under stress Hmm. because... Like any four-legged animal, you're going to square up with the threat. You can evaluate it. You're either going to haul ass or you're going to kill it. So that's 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 our approach. Making apex predators out of them, making better apex predators out of them. We need all the help we can get in law enforcement right now. You know, I'm, all I'm doing is offering experiences and truth, but I believe is that rascal right over there would, uh, would agree with me. Ten seconds of a true experience is worth 100 hours of academia. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know. I agree. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Intelligence and education are mutually exclusive. One doesn't equate to the other. So. Very true. Well, well put. Learning, on, learning well put. this kind front line like you have. So yep. just kind of give us a bullet a bullet breakdown of your past when you started JSO all the way up to where you retired. And we'll talk about the incident that you were involved in because, you know, I want everybody to hear that. But just give everybody your background if you can. Uh, okay. I, I started in 88. Uh, uh, worked in corrections very briefly. Then we had a, a hire. was required back then. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And we had a hire and freeze on, on white males at the time. So I went to Marion County, was a deputy there for about a year and a half. We ran our first uh, sworn officer academy, which pulled me back into Jacksonville, thank goodness. And um, uh, predominantly most of my career was as a tactical officer, as a SWAT officer. Say 18 years of that, 17 and a half, 18 years. It's a long run. Correct. Slot. Yeah. And then uh, I effectively retired in 2006. And um, I don't know if you remember or not, but I had, after 97, I, um, I started a shooting program. And uh, fortunately for me, I met the right people and that, that program went national, took it all over the country. And that really, really affected, that was kind of my demise with JSO, really, because I was away so much that. 
um, I had to make it a, a choice. You're either going to do this or you're going to stay with JSO. And I elected to, you know, I had a great career, but it was time for me to move on. So 2006, I retired. And if you want me to go in after that. Yeah, tell us about the overseas stuff. Okay. Well, uh, initially, let me tell you how I got there real quick. So I'll be very quick about it. When I left JSO in 2006, I had been working on the Grand Coulee Dam. Uh, with a contractor who was brought in by the Defense Department. Somebody after 9-11 saw something that spooked them. And that was a, that was a credible mm-hmm. infrastructure threat, and they had no protection on it. So that's initially where I went. We stood up a reactionary unit. When I say me, it was myself and a bunch of retired military, primarily 7th and 5th group guys. Um, we stood up a reactionary force, and while I was there, I was contacted by... An old friend of mine, an old shooting contact, an, an SF 7th uh, 7th Group Sergeant by the name of Joe Crane. He was now running a counterterrorism unit in Washington, D.C. Uh, for rail. And it was stood up by the agency. And it was just, they stood that thing up, kind of ass backwards. Three to, you know, They orbited, they just hired a bunch of folks like me with some backgrounds, older gentlemen, that would go operational immediately. And then they went training and recruiting on the back end of that. And we had a sister element in LA. And we I was there for four years and that was a completely disruptive unit, if you know what I mean. We're mm-hmm. not there to interview you. Mm-hmm. We're, we're there, yeah, it's a completely disruptive unit. <laughs> so I was there for four years. We developed relationships with Israel, Britain, and Germany. So if they had an oh shit, we would go to them. If we had one, they go to us. And, um, Obama and Biden were elected. We escorted Obama. We, we did his escort in on the train for the inaugurational day. But um, that... So they, they hired you you guys to... We did for to, the to Secret be, Service, to, to, yeah. To, they well, kind of subcontracted y'all to... It was a mutual agreement because um, they had their hands full with those two. Okay. And uh, and they and they really didn't know the rail. And if you have ever been on the rail, it goes through the worst places you can possibly go through through a city. So they felt it was better for us operationally to cover the number one as he came in at the end of the. Uh, plus, we had all the gear. If the train derailed, we could cut him out. If we had an operational contact, we could go hot immediately. And the bureau followed us by air. Um, you know, because it was just a smart thing to do, honestly. Secret Service was involved, but we were the QRF for that unit. And um, But our demise occurred briefly thereafter because Biden, being a trained guy uh, in Amtrak, uh, did not want us <laughs> under them. We were kind of shoved down their throat. So that unit was vaporized, ultimately. And when it was vaporized, most of the operators in that unit blew off to Afghanistan. And uh, that's how I got pulled into Afghanistan. I went in initially um, as a LEP, law enforcement professional, in southern Afghanistan. And I was embedded with two combat units. Yeah, there's, a, there's another word for yeah, LEP. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't there long. Um, I was, I, initially, they stuck me in a prison in Kalat, Afghanistan. Really? Yeah. I, oh, yeah. And, and that, was the, that was a wake-up call. So for I was, real? Yeah, oh, yeah. I lived in a prison for about six months. Um, doing all the mentor, mentored interrogations on the battlefield, um, was brought in from the battlefield, trying to figure out who we're fighting, you know, and uh, so forth. Generally, it was not Afghans, if you get my drift. Mm-hmm. Uh, from there, I got launched into a kind of a QRF situation, quick action response element in uh, Logman, which was with a, a combat unit, was best... Best bucket list thing I ever did in my life. It was outstanding. They didn't need a trigger puller. They needed what we do best, and that's read behavior. And a bad guy's a bad guy, whether it's in Afghanistan or it's in Jacksonville. You know what I'm talking about. You can spot that behavior. So we really started to make some headway in the field with uh, the LEP program because they did not have to they did not have to snatch these people up, cape them up, and fly them all the way back to Kandahar to interview them. Um, because they had experience right there on the battlefield. So we'd come in there and handle our business, and we would leapfrog from one AOR AOR to another, uh, chasing bad guys. And that's I think that's where we had our real value. Um, Toward the end of that, however, I was recruited by a gentleman that I I don't care to bring his name up. He's a congressman, 
Uh, it's not who you think it is. But okay. Right. Yeah, he, he had he had a business called Meta Solutions. He was involved in it. And um, they hired me to be a uh, part of a CAT unit, C-A-T, CAT team in uh, northern Afghanistan. So I ended up going from the south to the north and living in uh, at Camp uh, Mormal, which is a huge German base. And basically my job there was to, with a small element, was to spy on the Afghans. The Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police and report back to Kam Isaf, who was Dumford at the time, commander of international forces, and tell him if they were standing up or they're not. Right. You know, right. Uh, the A and A at the time were standing up, of course, not to our standards, but um, the A and P weren't simply because they didn't have guys like yourself in the room. And Dave, they didn't have mentors, you know, they would uh, put them through a chalk and talk German academy and then launch them out on a checkpoint and that's all the training they got and yeah it was an uphill battle so they didn't have people to follow uh to find out how you really do law enforcement and that's why they failed in my personal belief but um yeah it was interesting i did one six month stint at camp heath on the back end of that career uh at with the dea and that was training the afghan secret police and um had an outstanding time and then opium over there in there. Yeah, that's what I was about yeah, to say. I've stepped Where it comes in, from? I've still, guys, but in the fields, you, you wouldn't believe some of the stuff <laughs> I, I've been involved in. Yeah, I've stepped in some opium fields. I didn't even realize I was I was in them until I was in them. But yeah, you don't you don't want to be absorbing that. Wow, what a, what a yeah, what an honor to serve with uh, you know America's best, especially these young soldiers. You know, I just. Uh, I could have stayed in the wire and handled and probably handled my business within the wire when they brought people in or brought evidence, but I, it just wasn't in me. I couldn't. I saw my son is 30, and at the time I was seeing a bunch of my sons walking in and out of that gate, and there was no way in hell I wasn't going out with them. And it was the best thing I ever did. Um, yeah, and you were you were like late 40s, early 50s. I was 50, over here doing. Business. I was 52 getting 52, it in kids. Man. So yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, 52 when I landed. That was a wake-up call, though. When you're wearing that stuff 24-7 mm-hmm. and carrying a long gun, I mean, it and chasing 26-year-olds on, uh, yep. yeah, on uh, Go Juice, I mean, it was a wake-up call. I went over there about 215, 220 maybe, and I came back. I did two years back-to-back, and when I came back, I was 165. Wow. Yeah, I looked like uh, I had the skinnies. I mean, it it, it, was, it was an eye opener. But you know what? It's amazing what you can get used to doing. You know, and, uh, and yeah. that, again, that's a whole other story. Some young. of it I got to keep it's myself, it. but yeah. it all keeps you young. But you know, any and you know, it validated a lot of the things that we were doing here as law enforcement in Jacksonville, especially in in mine and Dave's backgrounds. Um, yeah, our skill level here was really prepared me for being over there. I mean, look, there's places in Jacksonville that I would not walk by myself, yeah. but there's places in Afghanistan. I, yeah, you know what? It didn't bother me a bit. You know, I said, Oh, I've been here. Not an issue. Yeah. And, um, the average person would be, Oh yeah. yeah. But I was right up my lane. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I got deemed up a little bit over there. I got some wake up calls. I mean, there was a couple of times I did not think Pete Solis was coming back. So I'm very blessed to be back, you know, and I, and I yeah. thank God every day for that. Well, that's that. not the first time you had some close calls. No, true. Near, near-death experiences. That's true. So let's um, let's talk about that. Okay. So in October 1997, mm-hmm. on the 19th, yep. you were, were you in patrol? You were still a SWAT guy, though. Were I was, a, yeah, I was still on the team. I had gone back to patrol yeah. because I was trying to make rank. You see how that worked out for me. <laughs> Um, that's the reason I went back to patrol because I wanted to get back into the uh, the routine. You know, I had impasse and oral views coming, and I just felt like it was better for me to be back in uniform, starting to get those reps. Um, but I did that mainly so I could uh, promote. Well, I'm gonna tell you something right now. Leadership has nothing to do with titles or positions. I've never never believed yeah. in that nonsense. Yeah. If well, if anybody knows me, I don't. I could care less about that. I Never got you. Yeah. So you 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 were you be given when it came to leadership. You be given well, a title, you, brother. Man, that means yeah. that means a lot. You I got, appreciate that. The titles really need to be earned. This is a great story. I mean, I remember my mouth hanging open. So, and I remember the night it happened. So, yeah, let's 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 get it. it was October yeah. nineteen ninety seven. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah, about. So what, how, I was a floater. In other words, I was just handling and, whoever's and, beat was and, on. And Dave Clark was working that night. He was. Yeah, he was out there. So Dave, yeah, he feel was. free to. Feel free to. Yeah. 
Yeah, wear your vest, baby. That's right. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, you know what? That my life changed, of course, expectantly. It, it would change after being hit, but um, man, what a, we have learned so much from this incident. So I'll tell you, it was it was about, and I'll be brief on this. About nine thirty at night. Now remember, we got viewers and listeners, so okay, a lot of them don't know anything about this. Never uh, heard the story. Anymore. I was riding on the south side of Jacksonville. It was a Sunday night. Uh, overcast, slow, highly unusual for Jacksonville, slow. Um, about 9 o'clock, about 8.30, 9 o'clock, I was able to 1084, break for lunch, break for dinner. I got to go home, and that's how slow it was. So I zipped home, tucked the kids in bed. My daughter, I think, was eight. Son was four. And, uh, yeah, I put the kids to bed, had dinner, told the wife good night. She's studying to be a nurse. She knew I had an off-duty job at Lumber, Lumber Unlimited over there off uh, Kings Road. I usually went there three nights a week just getting them kids through school. Hook it back to uh, Emerson to 995. I remember having a uh, checking alarm, 35 alarm call with Sandy Medlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had already done her cursory search. She walked out and gave me a thumbs up. And I distinctly remember looking at Sandy and said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm bored to death. I'm going up to I-95 in Emerson to look for something to get into. Um, I conducted a couple traffic stops, nothing to them, just guys trying to get home. I let them roll out, and I pulled in behind uh, the Chevron gas station at I-95 in Emerson. I backed in because, as Dave will tell you, we just been issued some new weapons, and I had an H&K 33. Um, I hadn't had that weapon a week. And, and and I was thinking to myself, I can't believe they pay us to do this, you know. It's a calling, baby. So I'm thinking, man, I'm a fortunate rascal. I got out. I opened that trunk. I inspected that weapon system and, you know, just thought, man, this is this is cool. I laid that weapon system right down. This is a learning thing that we've, we've taken from the incident. And I put it right down on my kit, all my, uh, all my gear, and I closed that trunk. I never could get back to that weapon during that firefight um, just because – Complex motor skills. I couldn't get a key and a key door to save my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that if, almost if it, if it took well, five seconds to get that key in that hole, that could be. All you know, the difference. I thought maybe I could peel my fingers under the trunk and rip the trunk open, but I, you know, just didn't work. Um, but, but that thought ran through your mind. It did run through Ripping my mind. The trunk open. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, while I'm sitting there, I got back in the car, catching the log up, um, talking to the wife on the cell phone. I notice a vehicle come off I-95 heading northbound. It turned its lights off which is a, you know, police work, that's a clue. Uh, entered that parking lot I was in, which was vacant, of course, and had a little bit of ambient light, and it kind of jockeyed its way up to the phone booth, but the gentleman that was driving never got out. He just kind of back, forth, back and forth till he got that vehicle in a position where he could look up and down Emerson Street and see the interstate. Tactical. Yeah, he but you a, know he what? He had a tactical mindset. He did, yeah, yeah. You know, he was... Uh, he was putting himself in a position where he could operate. Yeah. And I'm embarrassed to say, 10 years on the job at that time for me, and I'd been in five shootings up to that point, uh, gun and robbery didn't even cross my mind. I'm just thinking, what's this guy up to? You know, I, it just didn't cross my mind for some reason. and uh, But it did get my attention. So once he finally got parked, I hung up with a wife. I remember telling her, hey, this guy has no idea. There's a mark unit you know, right behind him. And uh, at the time, you would remember, Dave, you'd remember, we just came out with an MDT unit. It was, an old, it was our old version of a computer, a little green screen. You can log out on, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Man, we're dating ourselves. Yeah. So I logged out on a non-emergency, uh, just a 13, suspicious person. So the dispatcher on 501 knew, knew where I was, but none of them police officers in the area, and there were quite a few that wasn't up to nothing. They had no idea what I was out on. I remember pulling the car out from behind the Chevron gas station just to get me a little closer to his. I still was running dark because I think the dark is a policeman's friend. And uh, when I stopped, put it in drive, you know, we all have our habits in law enforcement. You know, I always had a habit of keeping a C cell flashlight on my left on the door frame. I remember taking the C cell out of the frame as I opened the door. I remember kickstanding the door, inserting that light right behind my gun belt in the back so I could get it with either hand, turning that molar roller all the way down. And I started just to creep and get a little closer. And I was wanting to, you know, find out where covering Casimba was. 
tags, just taking all that information as I could as I moved forward. I knew I had a white male um, about my size in the vehicle. And I knew he had a white T-shirt on, and there was damage on the vehicle. So, honestly, I thought it was a hit and run. He just killed the lights, pulled off the interstate to let FHP run by. Um, And it had Georgia plates, so it all made sense. You know, we're right down the road from Georgia. So, no big deal. But by the time I got to the back of the car, I was probably 15 feet from the rear bumper. And I'm sure the driver uh, either caught a glimpse of me in the rear view mirror or he just sensed my presence. Uh, excuse me. Either way, he dove to that passenger floorboard immediately, and the threat level went out the roof for me. You know, spidey senses went off. I'm out of the holster already on him. So is, he, di- is, is he diving for something, yeah, no. or is he ducking? Well, we don't. Uh, I'm assuming he's diving for something because right. he goes to the floorboard. Yeah. So um, I wanted to, to make two things. I wanted to make sure he knew. One, I was the police. I wasn't up there to rob him. And uh, two is that you know I was moving. I didn't want him to. I didn't want him to know I was moving. I kept my location was moving, so I just kept rolling off to the left. Um, he was cooperating, or at least I think he was trying to um, converse with me. His window was down about two inches, and as I was get, tell him to comply, put his hands out the window, drop the keys, etc. I was getting some type of verbal response, so I, you know he could hear me. He slowly sets up. He, ex- he puts his keys out the window like I asked, and he opens the door comes out. Um, when he came out, I'm looking directly at him, but because I got both eyes open, of course, I can see depth. I can see behind him, and I can see a, uh, a beer spilling out his contacts in a floorboard. So I'm thinking, you know, threat level's coming down a little bit. Guy's but just I pulling still, over to have a beer, yeah. He spooked me, you know, is what he did. It kind of mm-hmm. aggravated me. So I'm calling him over, and... Um, I'm letting the beer just empty out as he comes over. Excuse me, he's got an ID in his left hand. And he goes to hand ID to me. When he does, I reach past the wrist, pull him around, and protective pat down. I'm kind of overwhelming him at this point. And uh, who, what, when, where, and why, that kind of thing. And I noticed he didn't have any weapons, of course. I searched him. He had shorts and a T-shirt, barefoot. So the threat level has diminished considerably. I thought, you know, this, this guy's probably not a threat. He tells me that He's headed to Georgia. Makes sense. He stopped at the phone booth to call friends to meet him at Wacko's. All that made sense. So I kept his ID. I pinned it to my lapel. And I said, get the beer out of the car. Dump it. So I sent him back in the car. Uh, two guns in the car. I didn't know about under both seats. And he goes in. So he goes in, comes out, dumps a beer. Then I tell him to have a seat. Because I didn't want him to be mobile and, and me stationary in the back of my car, right? You know, running him. So I sit him down. He closes the door. I make the walk back to my car. Uh, giving him, I'm paying attention to him. I'm backing up. My eyeballs are on him. I sit in the seat. Um, immediately put his DL on the uh, steering wheel, you know, sleeve. I tell NCI, I go to uh, dispatch, hey, going to NCIC, go to 7. I roll over to NCIC. I asked to run a 1029, 1028. I want to check on this individual, and NCIC tells me they're down for the night. Mm. Of course. Of course. Yeah, Murphy's Law. They're Why down. Would Why wouldn't it be? Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm thinking about this, and uh, I'm uh, evaluating what I got here, and which I don't think is much, but I'm watching him, and he's doing something a little odd. You know, I can tell that he's got his head on a swivel. Mm trying to find out where I'm at. But he's out of the car? No, he's in the car. So he's back in the car. So no, I seated, put him back in the car. He's seated in the car. He's seated in the car looking forward, but he keeps looking over his shoulder. Okay. And which is kind of aggravate me at this point. Because yeah. that's not common for an adult. Juvenile, yes. Common adult, no. Yeah. So I lit him up with everything I had. I put floodlight, you name it, on him. It worked. It turned him around. And then I noticed that he's trying to eyeball me through the rearview mirror. I can see his eyes, so I know he's still searching. How close are you, Pete, at that point to Probably his car? Probably 35 feet, okay. 40 feet maybe. Okay. Yeah, max. A um, couple car lengths. A little, yeah, exactly. about a couple car lengths. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so I decided at this point, um, oh, and I had still not called for a backup. That was mistake mm. number two. You know, I, I just felt like, I, you know, I felt like it was going to be a foot it. chase or a, fire, uh, a, hand, a fist fight. So I said, I tell you what, I'm just going to, I'm going to walk up and see if he give me consent to search. If he doesn't give me consent to search, I'm going to let him roll. I didn't have anything on him. 
So I exited the car. As I exit my door, his door opens. I'm thinking, okay, I'm dropping pins. I'm getting as light as I can get because it's fixing to be a foot chase. And I exit pretty quickly and start making my approach the same way I approached the first time. He hadn't gotten out of the car yet. And I guess I got about 20 feet, 10 feet from my front of my car, and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Just, it, just, it locked me up in my feet, you know, immediately. It's like somebody hit me with a baseball bat. And subconsciously, I'm seeing a bunch of red flags, but consciously, I'm just not uh, adhering to it. Uh, but I did stop because I had that spidey thing going on, and I said, ah, something's wrong. So I went behind my car, the old trooper approach, mm -hmm. and came up on the passenger side. And um, I'm a lot more alert at this point, and I get to the bumper, and the way he's seated, I didn't see a gun, but I'm thinking, wait a minute, uh, this, this, this guy's got a gun, no doubt. This guy's way, and it really shocked me. He's waiting to ambush me. You know? I knew went it. from some guy that was drinking a beer, a yeah. low threat, to, oh, this may be on. Without a doubt. Yeah, and it really caught me uh, out in left field. I wasn't expecting it, so shame on me. Um, so I had to make a decision right then and there. I either go for back, go to my car for cover or confront him. And, you know, people have asked me over the years, why in the hell didn't you go back to your car? And I well, the reason is I didn't want him to catch me on open ground. He had already caught me once. And I figured, you know what? I'm I'm behind him. I've got, I've got high ground, and I got a little bit of cover, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be too concerned if he turns to engage in him here. I don't want to be caught in the open. So that's what I did. That was the plan. And I, I rem I'll remember as if this have happened yesterday. I, I had Danner boots on. I stepped forward to get a look in his lap. So I before I started engaging him. I wanted to make sure there was a handgun there. And uh, to describe the way he was seated, he had the door open, side view mirror was adjusted. He had that left arm locked out on the running well of the car. He was barefoot, remember? He had pulled his feet all the way up under the seat in a launching position. Right hand was driven between his crotch. Mm. And that's where the weapon system, of course, was. And uh, so I stepped as far as I could to get a good look. And when my foot landed, it put me right in the fatal funnel of that uh, passenger window. And everything in my life changed at that moment. You know, this is prior to Grossman, Lieutenant Grossman getting on the scene and explaining, you know, all these things that we take for granted now, like vasoconstriction and dilation and, you know, peripheral narrowing and all those things that happen to you under stress. So, the world started slowing up, alpha state, everything went in slow motion. My ears cut off. Um, I was announcing, and I was also trying, action versus reaction, I was trying to outrace him to the gun. And he won, you know, because action is, of course, faster than mm -hmm. reaction. He was already ready. Yeah. Uh, I'll never forget it. He looked over at me, and uh, he just mouthed the words, I'm coming out. That's it. He, so he talked to you. Yeah. He, 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 he challenged you. He goes, I'm coming out. Well, yeah. That's a challenge. That's a challenge, but it also, he looked like a kid man. that got caught doing something he wasn't oh, supposed so, to be doing. Oh, oh, so he doesn't know that you've seen the gun? No. Oh, gotcha. I don't think okay. so. Okay. You know, he gotcha. just looked and said, you got me, I'm coming out. Gotcha. Okay. And that's the last thing I remember because, um, but I know I saw the gun coming, the mm -hmm. shot coming, because the round actually uh, penetrated right above the sternum, right next to where our zipper was. And it lodged six inches under my left arm. It went through six layers of Kevlar. Wow. The first round. And what, what kind of weapon did he have? What kind of equipment? You know, he had two nine millimeters, and he was shooting ball ammo. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I'm very fortunate. Yeah. But that, that round hit here, and it lodged here, because I would have been moving this way to, uh, to outrun him to the gun. Um, the next thing I remember consciously is he's out of the car. I don't remember him getting out, Have but he's been hit already, Pete. Oh yeah, I was all right. So raised up and shot through the passenger he window. Yeah, he shot five rails through the passenger window. All he right. just raised up and launched. So stop right there. Mm -hmm. You just took a bullet. Yeah. Tell people what it's like. It didn't go through you, but what it's like to get hit with something like that. Yeah. The impact. Oh, the impact was severe. Like and getting it, hit with a baseball bat. Oh, I'll put. Yeah. Oh or, yeah. Or, then oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's a, yeah, okay. it's an impact, and yeah. it. Uh, fortunately for me, it was only a nine millimeter. If it had been something with three fifty seven, mm -hmm. something with some real ass behind it, it could have 
broke the sternum, shut me down. Fortunately, it didn't, but it was one hell of an impact. In fact, I remember screaming, not out of fear, but just that the cocktail we've been talking about, Mm -hmm. that major dump in my system, I now know for a fact it's where the horror scream comes from. You've heard of it, the shriek. It's because your vocal cords stretch. You know, it's it's a survival response. And I do remember screaming. I've just never been there before, and that impact put me in that realm. But you stayed upright, though. Yeah. You didn't you didn't lay, land on your butt. Didn't knock oh, your no, butt. no. It was just an impact. I sucked it up. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember him being out of the vehicle. Was the next thing I remember, he's actually leaning over the vehicle at me. So there's about four feet separating us. And I know he's firing because um, I can't hear it. And I, and I don't see muzzle flash. But what I do see is the slide recoiling to the rear. And I counted three spent casings go over his right shoulder. I counted them, one, two, and three. Wow. So things slowed down that much. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Slowed down that much. You're counting casings. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Your mind is kicking off so fast to take in stimulus Mm -hmm. that it just seems to slow everything down. It's called the alpha state. And I've been in it a couple times, I hate to say. But... Uh, I told myself subconsciously, Peach, either you got to shoot and move or you're going to die. And that's where training came in. That's why it's so important for us to make sure we tell the truth to these young officers, exactly what it's like to be involved in that incident. Um, But I I stepped right, taking cover behind the engine block, driving rounds through the front windshield, out the roof of the car, into him. You know, we were carrying 22s back then, the old Black Talon Ranger XT round. And I dropped him. Probably five rounds I fired, I dropped him. That was mistake Pe- number three. People listening, those are Glock 22s, 40 calibers. 40 caliber round. Not yeah. 22 calibers. So they traveled model, through the model. windshield roof, hit him in the chest, put him on the ground. Um, I should have advanced on him at that point and ended it. Um, but I didn't. I mean, I was still trying to ca- – I was a victim kind of up to that point. So I'm thinking cover – as fast as possible, and Dave knows me well, and fences and Pete don't get along. And that's all I had to my right was a fence in an open field, so I said, no, nope, I'm going back to my unit. Um, and I backed up toe to heel as fast as I could till I got my car in my peripheral vision. And when I did, mistake number four is I turned around and took my eyes off my adversary so I could punch in behind that car. Apparently, he stood, took advantage of the fact that I had my back toward him and launched two more rounds. The first round missed me. It hit, I remember it hitting my mark unit, the window exploding. The second round hit me in the back, just next to the vest and went through my back, through my shoulder and it exited through my tricep. Another, another, uh, like before it was just an impact. And what I didn't tell you is that the car when he was launching rounds and I knew he was firing at me and I I finally got the senses back that, hey, you got to shoot, move, or you're going to die, is when I took two other impacts. I had that flashlight in my hand and the first impact went, it was a through and through, lifted the meat on my arm about an inch. I could see right through my arm. The second round hit uh, my forearm, hit the bone and ricocheted came out the bottom of the arm. Now I will tell you, during the firefight, I didn't feel those impacts. But after the firefight, that bone hit, oh my God. You know what I mean? That bone, like Grossman tells you, bone hits hurt, and buddy, he wasn't lying. But during the firefight, none of those impacts gave me any pain. You right-handed? I am. Okay. Yeah, but I dropped that light, just got rid of it, wasn't doing me no good, delivered fire to him, and now I'm pushing back to my car. This round didn't hurt me either. It was just an impact, but it certainly motivated me to get behind that car. Mm-hmm. And that's where the long gun comes into play in the trunk. And you, find, you, you bleeding bad or or has your body kind of gone into self-protection mode and kind of oh, closed way, up to some yeah. of those wounds or, or, or those wounds? Are you bleeding all over the place? That's a great question. No, I'm not bleeding bad at all. No, okay. vaso had kicked in and most of that right. blood is in my trunk. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not bleeding bad at all behind a car, but I could see through my arm and that, that wow. was a problem. And I, and psychologically, I that's pretty yeah, impactful. You know, I could read my trunk, uh, my tag through my arm. Wow. So, um, I tell all young officers, don't, you don't need to look at your wounds. You need to concentrate 110% of your, your energies on ending whatever put that hurt on you. You know, you don't have time for that, but no, I wasn't bleeding a lot. Great question. I got back there, but I did worry about dexterity 
And um, so as soon as I hit a knee, I, now I'm driving rounds at him one-handed. And I, fortunately for me, I like to shoot one-handed. And I think officers should be pretty comfortable with both hands. But I'm trying to get a headshot. And um, he is actually pretty good marksman up to this point. He's leaned over the car in a two-handed grip. And again, mentioned earlier, with threat-focused animals, I'm, I'm focused on the weapon system and rights behind it. So I drop around, and fortunately for me, it impacts, it hits him in the wrist, the right wrist. It breaks his wrist, travels down and breaks his elbow and exits the back of his arm. Um, now he's a one-handed shooter, and it's left-handed at that, and he is hitting everything but me. So it gave me that little window to kind of catch my breath, and I wanted to know. Now, I, don't, I didn't know this, but I know his shooting got real sporadic. And um, he's running back and forth screaming. Eyes on me, just screaming like a madman. But, you, but you've, you've hit him at this point, right? Didn't I you, think I've hit him like once I, or twice. I know I've hit him at least three or four times right. at this point. Okay. And right. um, so this guy's no body armor. He's taking multiple. He has bled shots from, all over that vehicle for from some bumper talent, to bumper. Forty caliber ammo, and he's yeah. still up and running around. Oh, he's still up. He's motivated, right. buddy. It wow. just lights your fire at that point. Adrenaline is kicking yeah. for both of us. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that I had dexterity. It's when I looked at my hand. Uh, yep, I got dexterity. I can change. I can go to a new mag. That's not going to be an issue. And then that's when I noticed that I did have, um, like I thought, a major artery hit my leg. I was pumping out on my uh, trunk. When you mentioned, well, did you have any bleeding? I didn't notice any until I got in a kneeling position, and my left leg was um, pumping blood up on the trunk of the car, and I'm thinking... That ain't good. You mean like squirt? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's bad. You know, immediately reached down. That's arterial. Yeah, and black pants. Yeah. You know, I couldn't tell where it's coming from exactly, but I knew it was on the leg. Um, I'm thinking, man, that ain't good. Immediately, I went to my back to remove my keys to try to get that trunk open and keep my eye on him. It wasn't happening. I just gave up on it. Um, and then I thought about trying to stop the bleed. I put my hand over the wound, and it started pumping out another hole. So you got two problems now. I got to, yeah, I'm yeah. going to bleed out and I got a I'm time to I, I still got to kill this guy over here. Yeah. So yeah. this threat, I got to get rid of this threat. Yeah. At this point I'm thinking, yeah, that's fatal round. You know, that's, mm -hmm. you know, it is what it is. I mean, um, I love my family dearly. Thank God I, I didn't pass on that day. I've been able to see my kids grow up, but at the time I didn't think about my family and Dave knows me well enough to understand my mindset. I, uh, a calm came over me and I thought, well, it sucks I'm going to die in a Chevron greasy-ass parking lot, but... Um, I'm taking him with me. <laughs> yeah, he ain't leaving a parking lot, and he don't even know it. I said, but, you know, I'm not leaving, but he ain't leaving either. So uh, I had to develop a plan real quick because I really felt like I only had about 45 seconds, and I don't advocate leaving cover, mm -hmm. but... You reloaded at this point? I reloaded at this point. I think I had four rounds left in the weapon system, so I just free-dropped it. It hit the ground and skid out to the right of the car. That was my saving grace, I think, because I think he saw that magazine. You know, he knew he hit me, mm. and he saw the magazine slide out, so he probably thought I was out of rounds. When he did that, uh, immediately I, I retrieved a secondary mag. Now, I did something that's a little unusual. You'll understand if you carry a Glock firearm. You'll understand what I'm talking about. But I took the weapon system and actually put it under my chin. Not muzzle up, of course, but the frame down this way because I wanted to insert that magazine, eyes on him, and feel it seat at the same time. Uh, because I knew that, hey, this is it. When I, when I leave this cover... Uh, it's for everything. So I would, I, yeah, I didn't want, I did not want that magazine to fall out. So I made sure I had seated it. I could hear it seat. My eyes are on him. He's, he's coming to me. He's not running. He is just, frankly, he is walking at a hill, toe, toe gate. Um, all I can see is his feet, though, really. I concentrate on his knees and feet, and I'm just praying he gets close enough and doesn't go behind my car. And he doesn't. He goes all the way to the front of the car and stops. When he does, I lean out and I drove two rounds, high chest, center mass, right in the middle of the chest. He had a white T-shirt on. And I saw blousing like I've always seen. You know, generally when I've been engaged in something, I see one, two, three rounds on contact. And then the front sight becomes very visible. So I know I'm threat focused. I've always trained that way. And yeah, I, I saw the blousing bounce. I rolled out and hit him again. That's four high chest center mass hits. Um, he's still standing? He's standing. Well, he's oh, backing now. And, okay. and yeah, he, first he was smiling when he walked up. Now the smile's left his face. Mm -hmm. 
But I also noticed he's got a stainless gun in his hand now. Started with a black. He's changed weapons. Yeah, right? he's, he's, yeah he's changed weapons mm. during the firefight. Uh, he backs up four or five steps, then he turns and leaps, I know, 15 feet. It's hard to believe what the body will do under, under stress and adrenaline kicking, but he, he leaps over his, the back of his car, disappears from sight. When he does this, I start to advance. And um, I'm not moving as quick as I'd like to be moving. This leg's kind of gone numb on me. And by the way, this leg, this situation here, that round actually hit a quarter in my pocket, bent the quarter in half, and drove the round and the quarter through my quad. So, and it was bigger. I was this rascal size versus this. And it was a lot of meat damage. So every time that muscle would spasm, and, I mean, a big wound tunnel. Squirt blood. Yeah. So what? it wasn't your femoral artery, Thank obviously, because you, you wouldn't yeah, be here. Yeah, but I didn't blood. know that at the time. And yeah. uh, so I felt like, anyway, I've got to leave cover. i got to advance. I did so. As I'm pushing forward on him, I see him enter the vehicle, um, go to start the vehicle up. When he does this, I just plant my feet and drop about 10 rounds through the back of the car. All of them going through small hole in the back window. Um, I know that one of the rounds that I initially fired through that back window hit him in the back of the neck, and you could hear the slap. Uh, he bounced his head off the steering wheel, fixed his hat, rearmed himself. You know, the weapon first, he put it on the dash, he rearmed himself, threw it in drive, and then the car lurched onto that uh, fence and stopped just spinning tires. And I, I didn't advance on him at that point because I could hear that uh, death air. I could hear de air leaving his lungs. That We call yeah, it like a death gargle. gargle. Yeah, gargle. Yeah. yeah. And he rolls over in the seat, and um, I'd had enough. And I, that's when I got on the radio, called people like Dave to come uh, to come take care of business. And, that, and let me tell you, I have, to, I have to mention this to the folks at JSO. I'm standing in the, in the intersection of... Emerson Street and I-95, when I put out 1033, I've been single 18, been shot, he's been shot. You know, I need the cavalry here, like, right now. I'm telling you, in a matter of minutes, Siren. I can't believe that officers didn't kill themselves getting into that intersection. I mean, guys were coming off I-95 sideways. You know, it, it, that intersection filled up, like, now. It was the best I get emotional talking about it sometimes. It's the best feeling in the world. You know, when you've been in that environment and you got your brothers coming to you. And, um, what we used to say, the air turns blue. Yeah, the air turns blue, buddy. Yeah. Amen. And you don't hear Pete Solis getting and stuff like that. When you hear somebody like Pete Solis ask for 1033, you're like, what the yeah. yeah, That's why he didn't call for a 35 right away. Because there were, I remember working with guys like you, they're like, I got this. I don't need it. I'm not going to bother anybody you right now. You hear the sound. Mm. Some guys, you just hear it in their voice. Yeah. and like, that don't sound right. Yeah. So if he calls for Of course, he says 18. That's yeah. all it takes. But yeah. even, yeah. If he, even if Pete said 1033, you'd be like, mm, yeah, this don't feel right. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for saying that. But, buddy, you know, I tell my son now, I, you know, he's on the job. and uh, There he's new meat. He's, yeah, he's yeah. new meat yeah. through. Yeah, uh, told me. Yeah. yeah, he's new. He's doing it. I'm real proud of him. But I worry, you know what I mean? And the first year he was on the street, I had that portable in the house. And I didn't get any sleep. He was on midnights. So I didn't get any sleep. And I finally had to say, you know what? It's in God's hands. You know, he's found his lane. He'll make his way. And I just had to put that radio down. Yeah. yeah. Like you did. Yep. Exactly. Man. So now, um, you know, quite honestly, after 9-11, I didn't want to start. I mean, uh, after 97, I, I, it wasn't my goal to start a shooting program. But I felt like uh, mm -hmm. I was God was going to spank mm -hmm. me if I didn't. You know, I felt like it was, and you know what? And Dave's heard this story. I didn't. I didn't develop it to hand it off to, you know, these guys that. Uh, well, this happened for a reason because yeah. no telling how many lives you may save or have already saved because of what happened to you, mm -hmm. and then develop that program. Yeah. So it's, things it's, happen for a reason. Yeah, they do. They they yeah. certainly happen for a reason. And we're damn glad yeah. you survived because well, you are you. you are a survivor, brother. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I love the here. way I love the way with all the experience you've got, Dave's got, you you SWAT guys, you just sat here and counted out all the mistakes you made. Oh yeah, that's Instead how we of saying how good Pete yeah, did. Yeah. You counted out I, I, this was a mistake, this was a mistake, this was a mistake. Don't do this, don't do this. Yeah, don't do amen. That. And that's the stuff that we kind of wanted people to hear, especially Those some guys new do officers. A great job of debriefing after big incidents too. They always yeah. do that. They they crawl up and and that's one of the most impressive things. And they're like, hey, what could we have done better? What we do right? What we do wrong? Mm -hmm. It's always good. I mean, anybody should do that. Yeah, yeah. Very humble though. 
I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you very much. We, Tremendous. We, yeah, thank you guys. We really, really appreciate having yeah. you here. One of the most famous police shootouts in JSO history right there. Yeah. Without and that's, a doubt. that's what I said, you know, the young officers, uh, anybody looking to get in law enforcement, anybody that's been on, a lot of them weren't around then. You know, we've yeah. had some police shootings since then, and I've responded to plenty in various capacities. Um, but that one, you know, and then I heard the story after, you know, that one always resonated with me. Yeah. You know, a few stories, a few things happen while you're working, and I had about, was it, four years on then? So, mm -hmm. you know, it was, mm -hmm. I was like, oh. Now you're dating it's me. Like, it's legendary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you didn't well people were still talking about it. Yeah. What year did you come on JSO? Oh, 88. 88, I believe. The yeah. Same with him. Marion sure County Marion first. Yep. Marion yeah. in 87 or something? 86 and 87. Okay. And before that, I was in correction to P form for a year or two, you know? So, yeah, yeah. I've been here a while. Yeah. I had some other yeah. buddies that tried to come on around that time, and they had to take jobs elsewhere because of the yeah. affirmative action thing. Affirmative action, and then yeah. they came back. They finally came back to JSO yeah. when all that changed. Well, the guys from JSO mm -hmm. actually directed me to go to Marion County because yeah. uh, they stood Marion County SWAT team up back in the day, and they said it was just a great A. Small agency, but a great agency, and yeah. you ought to go find a home there for a while. So that's what I did. Yeah. Probably too slow for you. Well, we're glad you came back. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and everybody else here, the, the services you and Dave have put in, you know, in this city, is, you know, can't be. Yeah, well, you know what? It was our that. honor, man, to live this kind of life. I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. Well, we're glad you're not sitting home watching TV. No, you're sir. Out, you're out there helping people survive. And y'all yeah. got Dave out of the house, though. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm going to get it's this amazing. rascal involved with me again because we can't let that experience just I've, sit in the house. I hound him about that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, we need, that we experience need, is wasted. Need folks that can teach that stuff and do that stuff, you know, a lot, a lot of, I'm not going to get into too much, but, you know, it ain't all about, you know, dance moves, sometimes doing police work, sometimes you end up in those kind of things. Oh, yeah, quite often we do. And we're losing too many officers, yeah. so... And it's and it's there's been an uptick in oh absolutely attacked, so. oh absolutely they need to hear that yeah well bro yeah. I, I love you and I appreciate it Dave thank you for coming um, love to have you again yeah love talk, to do talk, it talk uh, we'll, we'll do one and just talk about the program yeah right. let's do that yeah, I'd love to do that just on the absolutely itself, well so. we could talk about that and we'd like to hear the rest of the story about what happened when the cavalry arrived and how the rest of the night went oh absolutely did yeah. go, did go, I will say this yeah. I saw pictures of him when he gave this and he's standing there with like, like half a mummy yeah. shit wrapped around him and he's pissed you can just see it on his face that he's pissed off yeah and that just let me know that that guy you know he, he you yeah. knew he was going to win that well fight. you know he's we didn't know. With, he's got bullet holes all in him but he's pissed <laughs> off yeah you know they we didn't have tourniquets back then or yeah. at least we went familiar with them and they got on scene they knew they weren't going to touch me yeah because you are in a different place yeah. and they just started ripping towels and swinging them to me and yeah yeah yeah, standing right. up, yeah. walking around after that incident. Like yeah, that was, amazing. You were at the hospital with him too, right, Dave? Yeah, yeah. it's highly yeah. overrated, man. Highly, highly overrated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of guys, and girls, or ladies, or whatever, become police officers, and oh, we can't I can't wait to get in that shootout or whatever. I have no, no idea. Yeah, careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> careful what you wish yeah. for. Yeah. No, sir. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we got to wrap. Okay. Um, All right, brother. Hey, appreciate you, brother. Yes, Pete. sir. Absolutely. Love, love having you. Love yeah, you. Mom. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, appreciate well. it. And um, thanks to my BFF, Dave Clark over there, for coming somebody, somebody and sitting off the side. Me. I'm telling you. Uh, yeah, him. he's unsupervised. We call this, un he's Speak unsupervised right now. <laughs> Reach sainthood or something. I got supervision of him for right now. So, all right, I love him too. That's my BFF right there. There you go. So, all one right. day maybe we'll get him on. All right, Pete Solis, thanks for coming. Thank Absolutely. you, brother. Dave Clark, thanks for being yes, here. Sir. That's a wrap for uh, Real Jacks with Jim and Larry and Crawfish. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time.